Thank you all for being here. My name is Dr. Dan Lesham, and I'm the director of this center. I believe I've met most of you, um, and I have to tell you, this is the end of our academic year here at the center. This is our last program, and it's been a remarkable year of events, but it's a real honor and a joy for me that this be our capstone event. The students that we work with in our fellowship program, we used to call it an internship program, but it's much more of a fellowship in the way it's run and in what you learn and in who we hope you become. The students in this program are uniformly remarkable people. The purpose of doing this program has always been to create the next generation of leaders for our community, for our region, for the world. Students who, and this is the remarkable thing, that the average QCC student at this college works in addition to being a full-time student, and the average commute time for students to this campus is about two hours from what I remember, each way. And these students in the room today have chosen and applied to participate in a program that does not give credit, that takes an additional hour each week over 15 weeks, plus the time that you spend doing your work, plus the time you spend interviewing a Holocaust survivor or a survivor of the comfort woman system in, um, in World War II, Survive, uh, speakers about hate crimes, this is all in addition to their full school workload. And for, for these young students to seek out and apply for and sit for and really grow under this program, we're really remarkably lucky that you would give your time to us and that you allow us to share what we have seen of the world and give you an opportunity to create your own sense of where you belong, where you can make a difference, where you can find your voice, and where you can, how do I put this? We're counting on you to make the world better, all right? It's not gonna be me, I'm too old, it's gonna be you. And I'm counting on each and every one of you that this experience that you've had over the last semester, and a few of these faces have been here for three semesters already in various internship programs, we're counting on you to leave this room but never leave these issues. Never leave the questions we raised over the course of this semester. Never forget what you've been gifted by the survivors you spoke with, which is an insight not only into human suffering, but into human resilience, into the human capacity to persevere. It's a message we often don't get from the media. Not too many movies are, are about that but it's key to understanding not only can humankind be incredibly inhuman to others, but human beings have an immense capacity to be good and to persevere and to want to share what they've learned and what they've suffered through with others to make the world a better place. So I thank you all for coming. Um, this program could not happen without the support of a great many people. So I'd like to thank, first of all, um, Dr. Diane Call, the president of Queensborough Community College, for her support. <laughs> Absolutely couldn't have happened without her. We also have several donors who contribute directly to this program, and you'll hear their names mentioned later when we call out the names of the interns who have been given their awards. But I'd like to really thank and recognize Dr. Marlene Blumen, who is here with us today, um, thank you. All of the various donors to the Dr. Arthur Flug Fund that funded one of our hate crimes interns. As well as Cheryl and Stephen Levine, who sadly could not be with us here today, but we will be introducing you to their named intern shortly. We also need to thank our elected officials, um, the Queen's delegation to the New York City Council, and especially Dan Drum, Barry Grudenchik, Peter Koo, and Paul Vallone, 
And we have a representative here with us today from Barry Grudenchik's office, David No. Thank you so much, and please pass our thanks on to the councilman. We also have New York State Assembly members to thank, Ed Bronstein and David Weprin, who have been generous and supportive to us throughout many years. I'd also like to thank the supporters of the Kupferberg Holocaust Center, the members, um, the advisory board, and in particular, Dr. Sandra Delson, who is with us here today, who has been a longtime friend and donor to this center. Um, but without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to President Call, who has some remarks for you today. Thank you. Thank you, and welcome. There's so many of you who have been part of the Kupferberg Holocaust Center for many, many years. Dan mentioned our legislative supporters who have been extraordinarily faithful in making sure that this center is able to carry out its mission to educate and to remember, which is very, very important. Uh, our, our friends here, our members of the Kupferberg Holocaust Center, our friends here are donors. You've already heard Dr. Sandra Delson, who's been with the center since its beginning, and she really has anchored so much of, of the awareness about what we do and support. And of course, to our students today, who really have taken to heart education, your experiences in each of the internship programs that we're going to hear about really demonstrates a person is never too old and never too young to learn and to teach. And I appreciate that you are giving us the opportunity to hear about your experiences and what you were able now to carry forward, because that's the important part of each of these experiences, is to ensure that what you have learned and that the lessons of history and sadly of some current events are kept in the awareness of everyone in our city, our state, our country, and certainly the world. Some of you have been part of our Global Institute at Salzburg, and we're very proud of you because you've carried the message even beyond the borders of the United States as recently as a few weeks ago. So I want to welcome each and every member of our faculty, our staff, our community, and especially our students. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to hear about your experiences. I'd like now to introduce you to another one of our very important partners in the community. I mentioned that we have three internships. Our Asian Social, so, Asian Social Justice Internship has been, since its inception, a partnership between this center and an, uh, a, a, a Korean American group in, based in Flushing called Korean American Civic Empowerment. Um, and we have here with us um, CJ Park from that organization who's going to share a few words about why they continue to support this program and invest in it and really co-sponsor it with the center. So CJ, please. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Chijin Park, uh, CJ Park of Korean American Civic Empowerment, a uh, co-sponsor of the Asian, Amer Asian uh, uh, Historic Justice Program. And uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate uh, our interns in three internship programs for uh, finishing your the wonderful I mean uh, semester and then learning about uh, the importance of the justice and and also I would like to thank you uh, <coughs> Queens, Queens Border Community College and Dr. Cole and Dr. Dan Lesher and other Copperberg Holocaust Center sponsors and supporters. Uh, for maintaining, for supporting these wonderful programs for this Copperberg Holocaust Center. We are really uh, honored to be part of this internship and we are trying to uh, do more for this uh, the, the Asian Historical Justice Program. And as you may already know that uh, uh, we are concentrating on com comfort woman issue to uh, to educate about the comfort woman and and uh, and we are trying to educate them to how to support 
this uh, important issue. You may already heard about that in early, I mean, uh, late last year, December 23rd or something, I believe, and the South Korean government and Japanese government, they had an agreement on this issue. But uh, the agreement was, um, I mean, the comfort home and survivors, they are not agreeing on that the, the issue and unfortunately the the survivors of comfort woman issue the comfort woman system they are still fighting for the justice for them they are still asking japanese government in an official apology and recognition acknowledgement of that what they did in during the world war ii so we are still fighting for that and we hope these interns be the part of the, the movement and giving some support for the comfort women survivors. And especially this year, they interviewed uh, South Korean uh, survivors, and then they also interviewed uh, survivors from Philippines. And, uh, and, <clears throat> and we are trying to expand that the support to other uh, con survivors in other countries. And, uh, I would like to ask these uh, interns to keep fighting and supporting for the comfort women survivors until they until we can bring up the, the justice to the survivors. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Um, and thank you, CJ. And now let's start hearing from our students. I'd like to bring up Jennifer Hickey, who's the instructor for our hate crimes internship. All right, hello, welcome. Thank you everyone for coming to our fellowship showcase this semester. Um, I want to say, as usual, it's been an absolute pleasure and honor to be able to teach the students in my hate crimes intern fellowship. It is my third time leading the course this semester and you know, I loved my previous two semesters, but I think third time really was the charm. This has been my largest class and, you know, my most vocal and open in discussion class. And I'm just so excited for them to present to you this afternoon. The presentation is um, each student has a part and they're basically going to give you guys a little crash course lesson in what hate crimes are. Both the legislation, the development of the term, um, and, you know, talk about several recent hate crimes that have happened within the five boroughs. The reason why um, I think this class is so important to be taught, not only here, but you know, anywhere, is that you know, our previous speakers have talked about the importance of education. You know, awareness of an issue makes it so much easier to talk about that issue or find a solution to that issue or come to an end or agreement about that issue. And I think the hate crimes course is a little bit special in that we really are looking to empower community leaders. We got to have a conversation about crucial conversations and how you address things when you get emotional or the other party gets emotional or when you're talking about a sensitive subject that's important to both people involved. And so we're looking to empower our students to not only educate themselves, but to when they leave the course, go out and educate the people that they know and love, whether it's their friends, their family, fellow classmates, to empower them to have those crucial and important conversations. So today we will have presenting uh, Melissa, Mark, Sadie Ann, Roberto, Nicole, and Daria. And take it away, guys. Thank you so much. OK. The history of hate crimes. The origin of hate crimes dates back to the ancient civilization. One of the earliest examples is from the Roman Empire, which is well known for the persecution of various religious groups. The FBI investigated what are, now no, what are now called hate crimes as far as back as World War I. The FBI role increased following the passage of the Civil Rights Act in 1964. The first modern federal law prohibiting hate crimes enacted in 1968. Washington and Oregon were the first state to pass the hate crime legislation in 1981. In 1989, the Hate Crime Statistic Act is reintroduced in the U.S. House, in the US House of Representatives. 
In 1990, the U.S. Senate passed the Hate Crimes Statistic Act by a 90 to 4 vote, and President George W. H. George H. W. Bush signed the bill into a law. Today, 49 states have hate crime status. Hate crimes occur on a smaller scale constantly all over the world. In the United States, the, ma the majority of the hate crimes are racial, racially motivated. The term hate crime was coined in the 1980s by journalists and policy advocates who were attempting to describe a series of incidents directed towards different racial groups. In, in 1997, Community Relations Service, CS CRS, was involved in 135 hate crimes cases. And the, and the cause, wait, that caused community racial and ethnic tension. As authorized by the Civil Rights Act of, 1990, of 1964, CRS became involved only in those cases in which the criminal offender was motivated by the victim, race, color, or national origin. Of all the hate crimes incidents reported in the U.S. Department of Justice Federal Bureau of Investigation, in 1996, 72% were motivated by the victim, race, color, or national origin. Thank you. What is a hate crime? First, we'll look at the words separately. And hate is generally defined as the passionate, a passionate dislike for someone. And a crime is an act that is punishable by law. So now we put these words together and we get a hate crime. Hate crime is generally a crime that is motivated by hate. For example, if someone is, OK, I'll use me. Um, if I'm on the train or wherever and I see, let's say, a, a gay couple holding hands, kissing, whatever, and I go and I assault one of them, that is a hate crime. And I get charged with assault, but the hate in it will give me like a tougher sentence. And now, uh, yeah, that's it. Okay, I'm focusing on the legislation of hate crimes, which has come a very long way since 1968. Even though there were civil rights laws that were passed, the civil rights laws didn't necessarily cover hate crimes under legislation. Things like civil rights were mostly like voting laws, women, we couldn't vote, African Americans, we couldn't vote. And also it touched discrimination, but it mostly touched discrimination like in the workplace or if you were applying for an application. So it really didn't touch the legislation um, f from the federal law, that is. So just some examples from Congress, how they stubbornly passed the don't ask, don't tell. A lot of us do remember that. In the military, where it was just the military's way of coding their ban on the LGBT community and allowing them into the military and offering them service. And another one, which was really big, was the passing of the Defense Marriage Act, denying same-sex couples the benefits and the protection of the federal law and the right of recognizing their relationship under laws and giving them benefits which was just absolutely crazy. So those were examples of how far we were coming under the federal law and how far the federal law was, wasn't willing to cover, um, wasn't willing to cover um, hate crimes and to acknowledge it. So recently much of this has been replaced in efforts to expand the congressional protection, which was really surprising. The law used to not protect, but now it's showing more where it's making much more of an effort to protect. So they passed a the legislation called the Matthew Shepard and the Lames Bird Act, named after two police officers, which go towards protecting the LGB community and making sure that they're heard when hate crimes are performed against them. And another big thing, which we got to really get an example of in our classes, was they set up several hate crime task force throughout the districts of the neighborhood to protect a lot of the religious communities and a lot of the ethnic communities, which was really interesting. Thank you. What are we? 
So the couple of states like like New York, Oregon, and other states that have before early back in the back in the fifties when they have passed the state laws, the state hate crimes. So pretty much when it came towards the years in two thousand, and pretty much when the legislations have started to develop the federal hate crimes, which covered mostly towards the race, gender, social class, and mostly disabilities as well. Well, when it came to the year when Barack Obama signed the bill in 2009, which was the Matthew Shepard's Act, which also included the, the LGBT, the gay community, as well as towards the, um, the transgender community, which pretty much protected more, even though that the federal laws in today's world, which we are still continuing to, to enforce these laws in the hate crimes, is still undergoing and still yet to not really the perfect world that we get into, but we are still undergoing towards looking into new ways to develop the hate itself. Thanks. Okay, so my partner hate crime legislation, so want to understand the legislation itself, like well, what gets you what gets you um, in trouble and what type of hate crimes and what happens. So the hate crime is mainly an offensive involving an actual attack. So hate crimes does not only involve the physical, I mean, sorry, the verbal communication, but once it gets physical, that's when you get charged for a hate crime. A hate crime imprisonment is usually 10 to 20 years, fined up to $2,500. Um, it's an offense that occurs not only, you can only be charged for state, but you can also be charged federal. Um, the difference between regular crimes and hate crimes, as I said before, it's um, harsher pen harsher penalty. Um, the time of imprisonment is sometimes even doubled, and the fines are even greater. Again, why is the punishment more severe? Mainly because not only do you attack the victim physically, but you attack them emotionally, and you can drain them out financially. Because as you know, when you attack a person due to their race, it could affect them emotionally, make them have to attend therapy sessions, psychiatry, psychology. So this does affect the victim in just more than one way. Oops, sorry. Here's a chart, usually, here's a chart based on the um, type of hate crimes, what are mostly motivated, usually due to racial. As you can see, that's the greatest, 47.3%. Okay, so when we think of the amendments, people wonder, does the First Amendment really protect us? So some people post, say that we do not get protected by the First Amendment. People usually reason is because aren't we allowed to say anything we want to say? Which is true until the point that the hate crime can, in a way, trigger violence, trigger negative acts, that's when the Congress limits you and it stops to you at the point. Um, sorry. And because of the 14th Amendment, it kind of in a way bounces back against the first because on the 14th Amendment, we're protected as equals. So in a way, it contradicts itself, but it protects us in a way that if we feel offended, if we feel that the hate crime, that the things still, ugh, I'm sorry, the things being said to us is very offensive, it does make us feel threatened, we are able to be protected under the law to go up to a police and does and say something about it. Now, there's a, now, some people may believe it's a violation because, as you know, we all have siblings, we all have family members who say stuff when we're mad. We metaphorically say things that we do not necessarily mean. So some people feel as if by us being punished, we're practically being punished by, for saying our thoughts. Now, other people feel that we're not that, this, that we are being violated because the Congress only limits us to a certain extent of what we could say, what we could post, and what we could actually do. And thank you. OK, uh, welcome to the New York City. Spring 2016, that unfortunately is full of hate crimes. And I want to show some recent hate crimes that occurred in uh, boroughs of New York City. One of them is happened in, um, oh God, in Brooklyn. Right, it happened in Brooklyn. Uh, the person named Alfred, uh, Gregory Alfred, 25 years old, attacked uh, a woman 
a, Pol a Polish uh, lady in Brooklyn and cut her throat. Um, it happened recently, it happened in March. And um, why is it different from any other crime? Why is it a hate crime? It's because um, Mr. Gregory Alfred uh, said that why he did it, he did it because she was white and he uh, does, not, does not like white people and think that there are system that doesn't allow him to smoke weed is bad system. That's why he used his hate and committed this crime. That's why this crime is a hate crime. Um, the next uh, thing that happened, it happened in April, end of April. Four, um, oh no, three teenagers attacked a man during the day in Queens. And their reason they attacked him, they, they called him Arab and beat him because they thought that he was an Arab, but nobody knows was it true or not. Uh, the reason that there is no picture of any evidences, I uh, assume that the man uh, did not want to show his personal information, and that's right because you know, being attacked during the daytime in peaceful Queens, that's really scary. But this is the hate crime, and the scariest thing that those guys are still not found. They're still. Police department, I still look for them. Well, another recent thing that occurred, but the ones who actually did it are already got what they <laughs> deserved by the law. Um, it happened again in Brooklyn. Four kids, years 11 to 14, um, caught the anti Jewish school bus on fire. Why is it hate crime? Well, they uh, did it to exactly Jewish school bus, and afterwards, uh, police said that one of them also um, uh, beat the um, Jewish school boy. So it's understandable that this is a hate crime. And again, it happened. To kids did it, and it's really hard to believe that people in modern society still do it. And that's why it's good that our hate crime fellowship is here. It helps people to see with uncovered with the hate eyes and understand what's bad and what's good. And thank you, Jennifer, for that. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to Hate Crimes Class of Spring 2016. I will now introduce the Asian Social Justice Group, but first I want to say that the creator and longtime leader of this program is in the room. Some, Jimin, there you are. Jimin Kim is in the back of the room. Thank you for your work. But this semester, the group was led by Jungmin Kim, and I'd like to invite her up now to introduce the students. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for uh, coming and joining us today. Uh, my name is Jungmin Kim, the instructor for uh, 2016 Spring Asian Social Justice Internship Program. The Asian Social Justice uh, Internship offers students the opportunity to explore uh, World War II and its aftermath from uh, uh, Asian uh, you know, perspective and how women and men in Asia have lived through this war and its aftermath. And we are especially focusing on the history of Compro Women system. Compro Women is a euphemism for women and girls who were forced into sexual slavery by Japanese Imperial Army before and during the World War II. Um, as uh, Dr. Renshim just introduced, uh, Dr. Jimin Kin, who is sitting right over there, has been developed and run this program for several years. And this semester, I was fortunate to join and work with really great 10 intern students. Over the uh, six or 12 weeks, the students have explored the issue of comfort women 
in the context of history of Japanese colonialism and imperialism and World War II war crime and also wartime sexual violence, women's human rights. In addition to text analysis and very active class discussion, they also had a really rare opportunity to, to meet with uh, a Korean uh, comfort women survivor, Ms. Yong Su Lee, when she visited New York and uh, really uh, nicely offered her visit to uh, here, Kinsborough Community College. They also conducted a group interview with uh, survivors in Korea and also in the Philippines. Based on the learning and inspiration, students have worked together for their final group project, which I'm very glad to introduce to you today. Uh, so this uh, presentation will be moderated by Tameka Edward Nancis and joined by Malik Jackson, Alejandro Ria Plido, Adila uh, Kausar, and other interns. Please join me and welcome the Asian Social Justice Intern Groups. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> I'm going to ask my fellow interns to join me, Malik Jack Jackson, if you could take a seat, Adila Kusha, and Alejandro Leah. Comfort women are women and girls who were tricked sold or forced to the Japanese army for their sexual pleasure against the will of the women and girls. Some refer to them as prostitutes. A term we have come to learn cannot be used to describe these brave women. These women were never paid. They were literally sex slaves. They were forced to have sex with men who had very little regard for them as human beings without any form of payment and held in the lowest of conditions. They had to witness these girls being tortured and killed for refusing to complete their acts or for trying to escape the hell they were trapped in. We, the students of the Haitian Social Justice Internship, are proud to stand with these brave, distinguished women in their plight for an apology, a chance for Japan to admit what they have done and to bring awareness to everyone who will listen so that this will never happen again. A chance for these women to be at peace. And as they have taught us, the current Japanese government is not the enemy, and we should not hate them. But to move forward, Japan, Japan should listen to and respond to the, service, to the survivors' demands quickly. The, service, the survivors are asking for full acknowledgment of the military sexual slavery imp implement, implemented by the Imperial Army of Japan between 1932 to 1945, thorough and complete investigation to fully chronicle the scope of the crime, formal apology from the National Assembly of Japan, legal and full rep rep reparations to all victims, prostitution of the prosecution of the criminals responsible for the crime, full and ongoing education through proper recording and acknowledgement in textbooks and history in Japan. Building of memorials and museums to commemorate the victims and preserve the history of sexual slavery by the Japan military. These group of very in intelligent interns would like to use this opportunity to show what we have learned and to outline our contribution and legacy we wish to leave behind. But in doing so, we have to pause and acknowledge Ms. Jiang Min Kim. We want to thank you for taking the time out to share, in, to share and enlighten us to the horrendous ordeal these women have faced. If you could pause and. <laughs> we want to also take the time out to thank Queens Bar Community College. We know that without you, we, could not have, we would not have been here. We want to also thank the hardworking directors and staff of the Harriet and Kenneth Kuffenberg Holocaust Resource Center and Archives, and the Korean American Civic Association for the priceless opportunity that was allotted to us. We applaud you for doing so, and thank you again.
we want one of our legacy that we want to leave behind is a t-shirt design we want to um leave that legacy to the the center and to the the association for always being so that this this internship will continue throughout even after we leave we want the this design is the definition is comfort women were women and girls who were forced into sexual slavery by the imperial japanese army in to occupy territories before and during the world war ii this was translated into seven different languages spanish korean japanese chinese french german and italian we also wanted to point out when we tried to Google the, the different translation and meaning, we got so many different meaning of what Comfort Woman Survivor really is. So we wanted to make sure that when we leave our t-shirts, that it stays behind, that we know the true meaning of Comfort Woman and, and the survivors. At this time, I'm gonna turn over to Malik and Adila, who is gonna be sharing with you the inter interview we had with our Comfort Woman. Um, we um, had an interview with uh, Young Soli, and she was born in 1928 in Korea. Young Soli lived with one older brother and four uh, young brothers, parents, and grandmother. In 1944, Young Soli was 16 years old when she was kidnapped and was sent to a Japanese military camp. In the camp, Young Soli was raped and guarded by the military, Japanese soldiers. After 1945, Young Soli has lived her life in shame and disappointment because of the rape and abuse she had to endure since um, the war until 1992. After the war, her mother um, accepted her back into the family. She did not spoke to them about the rape and injury. Before 1991, all of the comfort women that had survived did not spoke up about the abuse they had to endure from the Japanese um, government. 1992, Young Soli spoke out about the abuse she had to endure since the end of the world of War II. Since coming out, Young So Lee had um, about other comfort women. So Warbus has spoke about the injustice comfort women had to face from the Japanese government and other injustice women faced all around the world. Everyone is everywhere is this since 1991, um, all the comfort women survivors get together and protest in front of the Japanese embassy and demand the Japanese government to know the pain they put on these women all these years. Um, we had the opportunity to interview with Young So Lee. Uh, we, we have asked her five basic questions. Uh, the first question was, how can we prevent this from ever happening again? The response that, um, the response that Young So Lee um, stated that by telling your friends and family members about the abuse they have endured since, since World War II is by keeping the legacy going on by telling others about informing all about the comfort women issue. The second question that we asked her was, did you and other comfort women got married? Um, her response was, she has, she didn't get married and she hasn't any children of her own. And the third question we said was, how did your life change after the war? Um, Young Sully, um, after World War II, has lived her life in shame and disappointment because of the abuse and rape that she had endured since World War II. Um, the, um, the fourth question was, has there ever been a time since coming forward that you regret um, that you regret coming out as a comfort woman? Ever since coming forward as a comfort woman, she has not regret whatsoever. She's been she's been keeping fighting since 1991 to inform, to demand the Japanese government to give them an official apology. And the last question was, what what happened when you come forward as a okay. What um, today, what is Young Soli doing today? Back in March of 2016, Young Soli has came to Queensborough Community College and pretty much she was talking about the comfort women issue. The second major um, event that has happened, that has happened to Young Soli is that she got, what, has sat an award from the Los Angeles City Council, the Human, the Hero of Human Rights Award from the legislation from the Los Angeles City Council. And, and mostly on Wednesday, every Wednesday since 1991, Young Soli has been protesting in front of the Japanese embassy, demanding the Japanese government to apologize to the comfort women and to all the all, all the lost workers. Um, there's a slide showing that she has received the 
um, Hill of Human Rights Award by the Los Angeles City Council members and also by the President of Convention of Styles of Women. And the second slide and the last slide is that a movement only dies when people forget about them. So we're asking you, please never forget about them. Never forget about them. Thank you. Thank you. Alejandro had the privilege to interview a Philippine survivor. He's going to share his presentation now. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alejandro, and I'd like to share with you um, an interview that I had with uh, one of the survivors in the Philippines. Um, so we have Lola Estelita. Lola means grandma in Tagalog, which is the language spoken in the Philippines. Uh, now I'm gonna tell you a little bit about her story, which is um, basically what she shared with me. Okay, so she was born in 1930 uh, in the Philippines. In 1943, she started working in a in an airfield, um, gathering stones to patch up um, the land strip. Uh, this was basically a trade, sort of trade job with the Japanese army, where they would give her a ration of uh, two cups of rice after every shift. And then, on 19, in 1944. They saw planes with stars in their tails uh, dropping messages to stop working in the field. Uh, and after being advised by her dad to stop working, uh, she decided to go back home. And uh, one day of that same year in the market, the Japanese army came and she was abducted. Um, taken to a house and raped, hit several times. Then, um, after three weeks of being abducted, the uh, American army occupied the uh, camp where she was and uh, she was liberated. Now, um, Lola Celita lives now in a center called Lila Filipina, which is a center dedicated to the support of comfort women uh, in the Philippines. This center was created only a year after the movement was created in Korea. And, um, it, origin it, re it originally had 175 survivors registered. Uh, 100 of them, about 100 of them have died. Um, and only a few of them, about 10, participate in uh, the activities organized around the issue. They demand um, from the Japanese government a formal apology an acknowledgement of the history and uh, proper compensation. And they also propose to raise awareness within uh, Japan by uh, asking young people to join forces to pressure the Japanese government. <coughs> now I'd like to um, tell you a little bit about the difference between the comfort women in Korea and in the Philippines. Um, so while the Japanese army initiated their expansion um, in Asia in like before the World War II and during the World War II, the expansion in Southeast Asia was towards the end of um, the war. Um, and although the sufferings were the same, by both group of women, uh, the Filipino women uh, had to undergo this um, imperialist in, uh, expansion for like substantially less time. Um, 
Now, tell me if I would like to um, read the acknowledgments. As a group, we'd like to extend our gratitude for this enriching interview with Lila Filipina and its directors, its, its director, Miss Rachilla Extremadura and Miki, Michiko Fukuda, who is a Japanese activist working in the center. Also, a big thanks to Lola Estilia. Estilita for sharing her story with her, her story with us. We want to again say thank you for we know that it is not easy putting on internships as these and we want to ask you to continue because before this I had no idea about the comfort women survivors. So I'd hope that when my kids grow up and going to school and our, all our kids that this will be something that is in our textbooks that we will know that this is not something that you just hear by the wayside. It needs to be something that is taught in our schools, that it will never happen again. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jean Min, and the Asian Social Justice Class of Spring 2016. Thank you all. We now have our uh, final group of presenters from the Holocaust internship, after which we will do a ceremony of handing out certificates to all of our student interns. Um, I now turn the floor over to the assistant director here at the KHRCA, Marissa Berman. Ho Marissa Berman Hollywood, I apologize. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. <laughs> My name is Marissa Hollywood. Thank you so much for being here. Um, thank you for coming to celebrate all of the, the fellows, the interns, particularly those in the Holocaust cohort. I was blessed to have a group of nine wonderful students this semester. The students worked very hard to learn about the Holocaust and understand the Jewish experience in Europe during World War II. So I just want to start with some acknowledgments. First of all, I want to thank all of the Holocaust survivors that took their time out to meet with all of our students and to share their stories. We know it's not easy for them, and many times this opens old wounds, but it's so important for our students to hear directly from the survivors their stories. Not Most of the survivors weren't able to be here today, but I do want to thank in particular Ms. Anita Weisberg, Holocaust survivor, who came here today. Anita is a huge supporter of all of our programming and she always goes out of our way to come to all of our events and to come and speak to groups and we're so grateful for you for doing this. I also want to thank Dr. Dan Lecham, our executive director, for all of the work that he's done here at the center in the last year and all of the work that I know you will do in the future. I also want to thank um, Vice President of Institutional Advancement, Rosemary Zins, and of course, Queensborough President Dr. Diane Call for support of this and other programs and for bringing me on as Assistant Director in 2012. It has truly been a privilege to work here at Queensborough, to learn about the Holocaust, to have the opportunity to teach about it as well. So I first started doing this internship in spring of 2013 uh, when Dr. Arthur Flug asked me to run it. And it's been seven semesters, and each semester I learn something new, and it's even more impactful for me. And I'm grateful for each new student that I get to meet and work with. And this semester I'm really excited because in a lot of the other internship programs are students that I've worked with also, so I'm very proud. So just to very quickly recap, students meet with me across the whole semester, about 12 weeks, for an intensive study of the Holocaust, and we cover anti-Semitism, the Nuremberg Laws, the Vance Conference, death camps, rescuers and resistors, and immigration and life after the Holocaust. And the program culminates with the students getting assigned a Holocaust survivor that's local, and they interview them one-on-one. -on -one. So today, the students will come up and briefly share the story of their survivor, and most importantly, their personal reflection, reflections on how it impacted them. I'm very proud of these students and what they've done throughout the semester, and I'm very excited to hear their remarks. So what we'll be doing is the students will be coming up in three groups, and each has a different overarching topic, something that they walked away with from the collection of survivors that they interviewed. So the first group, group one, will be Ashley, Ricky, and Maria, if you will come up on stage. And for them, the focus of all of their interviews was this idea of luck and blessings. So I'm going to turn it over to them. Okay. 
Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. <laughs> Tough crowd. <laughs> My name is Ashley Gill. Um, I attend Queensboro Community College. Um, I am trying to pursue a dream of being a pediatric nurse. And um, today I was given the opportunity, actually last week I was given the opportunity to interview a Holocaust survivor, and her name was Hannah Dewich. Um, one thing that I learned from Hannah Dewich is that she was forced to mature and grow up fast um, at a young age. She was taken away from her grandmother at the age of 16, and at a young age she was transported to England by the kinder transport. She had, I'm sorry, she had to take care of a lot of kids on the kinder transport because she was the oldest one. And approximately those kids were about 150 children. Um, and she had no one else her age, so she was alone. But um, as she grew up, she pursued her career of nursing and um, she was a British veteran. Meet, meeting Hannah and interviewing her in her home is an opportunity I would never forget and I would pass down to others. I believe that she was one of the lucky ones because if it wasn't for the kinder transport, she would not be able to tell her story today and I, I really do appreciate that. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ricky Panioli. I'm a criminal justice major. Uh, about three weeks ago, I was, had an opportunity of going to uh, Austria where I visited the concentration camp uh, of Downhow. Uh, it's a memorial there. And um, as an intern here at the Holocaust Center, I was given an opportunity to interview a Holocaust survivor by the name of Hanny Liebman. Um, Hanny Liebman had to flee her home in Germany and was transported to a concentration camp in a French town called Gers, Gers Concentration Camp. Um, she was also one of the hidden uh, uh, children in a Protestant uh, French village called Le Chambord, or Le, Le, Le Chambord. Le Chambord, thank you, thank you so much. Okay, um, and so what I learned from Hanny's story, uh, I, I had a lot of unanswered questions about the Holocaust, even though I learned so much about it, even though I went to Dalhau, I still had a lot of unanswered questions and, and listening to Hanny's story and interviewing her, filled in a lot of the blanks. And I learned a lot about what greed, human greed does to people who thirst for power, who thirst for economic uh, advancement, and what some people will be willing to do to other human beings uh, for that power. And um, what a blessing it was to have somebody like Hanny uh, have the courage to be able to uh, flee, you know, and leave her mom, you know, for a better future, for the opportunity at life without oppression. And I think that um, it's, it's a blessing to have uh, people like Anita. It's a blessing, you know, to have people to be here today that can tell us the stories of survival. And it's also equally a blessing to be able to learn from them because these are stories that have to be passed on. These are stories that have to be told, and we have to learn from them as, as human beings because this is how we learn about the complexity of the human condition. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Maria Rao. I am currently working towards a degree in business administration. However, I am very interested in defending human rights, and this is the second time I do an internship with the Holocaust Center. And the reason is because although we can learn history through books, reading, or in classrooms, it's not the same when we have the opportunity to ask 
someone um, how was the situation when they were there. Hearing the story from someone who was there and who lived there. I have the privilege to interview Miss Jane Cable and the difference from her to others to other survivors is that she was not sent to a, to a ghetto or to a concentration camp, either kinder transport. She was um, she she and her family took a ship to go to Cuba and when they got to Cuba they rejected them because they wanted more money but they didn't have more money because all their money was left in Germany. So they were told that they had to, to go back to Europe again because they will not take them. And some people committed suicide because they were afraid to go back to Germany again. Who wouldn't? Like They just came from there because they were scared, they were afraid, and now they are told that they have to go back it's like you have hope and then they take it away from you. And she and her family didn't lose hope. And when they got to Europe again, they were told that four countries will take a quarter of the people that were in the ship. And her family was taken and they were sent to France. In France, she spent around six months and then she traveled to United States. Um, she and her family decided to come here to pursue and to seek a better future, a better life and opportunities. And currently she lives here in New York for so many years. As you hear this story, I, she believes and I believe she was very fortunate to take that ship because she was not sent to a, she was not sent to a concentration camp or ghettos. And let me tell you that it is really difficult because as a Ricky, I had the, the opportunity to go to the Dahao concentration camp, Memorial Side too. And it was so hard to be there. It was a Tuesday and it was very, very cold. And I had a jacket on me. And I can think about how those people with those uniforms were there without a jacket, without eating, without shoes that have quality to walk and there are so many rocks that you have to walk on them and you can even feel them having shoes imagine people that they didn't have to and it's just really hard to be there it was so heavy and so many emotions that i found in myself because not everyone had the same opportunity that jane had and this is why i believe she was she had she had a blessing from god and it was a miracle that four countries took people from this ship that she could go to France and now she lives here and she has sons and now she can share her story with so many people. And when I was talking to her and the most thing that shocked me was that Cuba didn't take them because they didn't have enough money. And right now in the 21st century, we can see that there are so many refugees in Syria and in so many countries and they are looking for a place to go and there are so many countries that don't want to take them because of the same reason, because there is not money and because economics reason. And this is so selfish from, like, from human beings because we are not in their shoes and that's why we don't care. But the thing is that it's not about they, it's not about us, it's about we and we should support humans no matter in what situation they are or in what, in what situation we are. Maybe we think we are going through a hard situation but let me tell you, there is someone who's going through a harder situation than you. And this is why I just want to tell everyone that is here, not only think about yourself, not only think that, oh yes, this is so hard. There are people that are going through a harder situation than you, and you should think about that. And it's hard, but you feel relief when you know that you can help others. And I'm feeling really blessed that I could do this because I also went through a hard situation in my life. I, when I was seven, my father died um, from a heart attack and my mom is, was with me through all these years and it's like in life there are so many unfair things but everything happens for a reason and maybe we don't know the reason yet but there is a reason for everything and that's what I learned from Jane and through my same story because I know that my story is not so hard and so difficult. I know there are people who have a hardest story.
that they can share, but this is from my perspective. And I still believe I am also very fortunate that I'm here today sharing with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. That's wonderful. So I'd like to call up group two, Edwin and Dominic. These interns, their overarching focus from their interviews was the idea of overcoming adversity. Do you want to sit at the first chair? Um, hello, hi, my name is Evan. I'm a criminal justice major, and I would like to say that the experience was like really opening to me because like, I got to learn like a lot about the Holocaust from like someone who actually experienced it firsthand. And like one of the main things, or like the main thing I got out of it, was that even in the face of adversity, like you can overcome it and, and achieve greatness. Um, so like I wrote kind of small speech about it. In terms of overcoming adversity, in a general aspect, adversity is more than just one difficulty or setback. It's a series of misfortune that keeps us from achieving our goal and finding happiness. Again, like I said, like my hurt, my own victim was he was taken away at a small age, and he had come, he had overcome a lot of adversity. But through it all, he overcame it and grew up. Like he raised a happy family, and he learned to like continue his studies and everything like that. So I just want to say, like, it's true, like, even in, like, the time of, like, darkness, like, you can overcome adversity. And the funniest thing is when I was working on preparing this, I, ran, I, I found a quote that was, like, really inspiring to me. The quote reads, in spite of discouragement and adversity, those who are happiest seem to have a way of learning how, from difficult times, become stronger, wiser, and happier as a result. And it's true about this quote, like, even in the face of adversity, like, you have to, like, overcome it no matter what that things may seem dark, but like, it should be at the end of every dark zone of the light. So you can always push forward and like, like, try to achieve more and greater things. So again, I just want to say like, thank you for like, giving me the opportunity to like, really like, learn more about Holocaust from someone who actually was there firsthand. And yeah, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Hello everybody, my name is Dominic Joe King. Um, I'm a graphic um, design major here at Queensborough Community College. Um, I, I first joined this um, internship just to um, learning purposes. I just wanted to learn more about the Holocaust. There was a lot of things that I didn't know about it that I did learn in this internship. And I was fortunate enough to um, interview Ms. Ania Westbrook. Um, for, um, and she was just telling me about the stories and everything that she went through. She was um, only 14 years old when she, um, the Hitler soldiers came to our home in Austria. Um, she witnessed a lot of things going on. Um, there was a thing called Christmas Nights that, um, I believe I'm pronouncing it right, um, where she watched um, soldiers destroy businesses, um, destroy home, um, homes, um, hospitals, schools, and she suffered through a lot. She had to watch her mother and her parents suffer due to um, the crimes that it was committed at that time. However, uh, she was fortunate enough to be um, a part of the kind of transport. She, um, I really, um, when she went, she was very scared because she even said a joke um, when they had told her she was supposed to go to England, she thought England was in outer space. <laughs> she had no idea where she was going or what she was about to get into. She was only so young, but she still remained strong throughout it all. Um, when she had finally arrived to England, she um, was sent to a woman by her name by the name of Miss Butcher, and she um, basically took care of her. Um, wasn't able to go to school, but eventually she did start working. She got married and had kids, and as um, she began um, growing up, she felt like she owed something to society. She felt like she had to give back because of so much that was taken away from her um, as, a, as a child. So she, once her children was able to um, start going to school full time, she began volunteering more. She goes to high school. She talks to kids all the time about everything she went through. And just overcoming adversity is very uh, something that's not really easy, especially for people like her that went through what she went through. Um, she believes that a lot of things could have changed if people just spoke up. Well, I remember she told me that um, she talks to her kids all the time and tell them that 
you have to be more of an upstander. I mean, I'm a bias, um, more of an upstander rather than a bystander. You want to see something happen to someone, you have to please do something about it. Don't just be silent. Always, you know, say something because someone had to say was to say anything that happened at that time. Maybe all those people want to have got um, murdered, and you know, the things would be different. So I just learned a lot, and just she's such a very strong woman. It really, like, it opened my eyes a lot. It helped me appreciate life and time more, and just understand what to do with just the time that I have. So I really appreciate being you. I appreciate um, everyone. Um, I appreciate this internship. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. And our final group will be uh, Kate and Claudia, if you could come up. These interns will focus on the overarching idea of coming of age. So have Kate go first and then Claudia. concentration camps were in many parts of Europe, not just in Germany, was surprising. Before, I was thinking that the concentration camps were only in Germany. Meeting the Holocaust survivor was a very memorable experience. It was almost an honorable experience. My interviewee's name was Ellen Zilka. Mrs. Zilka survived Jewish Holocaust by the aid of kinder transport. Hearing stories from her helped me to more vividly and indirectly experience the horrible past. Only 10,000 kids were moved from 1938 to 1939. I was impressed by her positivity and gratitude toward life. I give special thanks to Mrs. Hollywood and those who gave me this opportunity to take this internship and to Mrs. Zilka who taught me about the importance of human life and the positivity of mind. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kate. My name is Claudia Teran Garcia. My major is Liberal Arts and Sciences, and I come from Colombia in South America. Uh, I got, um, I interviewed Elena Markovitz. She's from Hungary, and I would love to take this moment to tell everything she told me, all the things she went through, all all the story in such a detailed way. But I'm not. I I'm sure the um, time is running, and I have to close quickly. And um, well, she is now 71 years old, but her storytelling telling was so neat that I was able to picture everything, almost everything of the things she said. Um, here, as many other children that did not know what, this, what was happening at the time, were innocent of all that was yet to come. Until, um, it was April when Nazi soldiers break into her home in order to take her and her parents to a, to a ghetto. This was when her story took another course and everything happened in such a fast pace and incredible manner that I was speechless by the end of the interview. Elena told me about everything she saw and happened in Auschwitz. Hearing all the events of brutality from her was incredibly different from what we studied and learned in this internship. Elena said, I don't have the necessity to lie about this. And a chill went through my body and a deeper sense of understanding came into my mind. This was ultimate and unexpected, but my best and most memor memorable, memorable thing about her story goes beyond 
all this injustice. It was a proof of love and faith. As, her, as the story went on, I realized how fortunate she was and she is. I like to think that faith played a crucial role, role in her story when she sleeps through the, through the soldiers to get to a dark side of the barracks to be with her mother. Elena couldn't explain why or how this happened, but I could sense the emotion and tension on her expression when she was telling me this. It was faith, but, most, but I am mostly sure it was love that made Elena take the risk to be with her mother. This was definitely the most memorable, memorable moment of all the course of the interview. I was impressed by the amount of... I think Elena's life changed very quickly within a very little amount of time. I was impressed by... for the amount of detail of her story. It was like she would remember what happened as if it happened yesterday. I was very grateful for getting to know her story. I felt Elena was a relic of the past and was indeed going to be remembered by generations to proceed. The last thing I asked her was, what do you believe we can do to fight indifference, hatred, racism, and anti-Semitism today? And she replied by simply asking about, um, by simply to stop being racist. And I cannot agree more on that. Uh, racism nowadays is transcending the true values of life and is building this society out of hate. It is taking each other to be the enemy of one another. It is causing, causing wars within countries and even cultures. If the preceding generations learn from this story and stop being indifferent of the stop being indifferent of the problems of others, maybe we will live in a less unequal society. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Please join me in congratulating the Holocaust internship for spring twenty sixteen. Thank you all, I'm truly inspired, as I'm sure you are, by each one of these students. Um, and uh, I got more than one chill in my spine when listening to you, so thank you for sharing. We will now be presenting the certificates of completion to our students one by one by class. I'd like to let everyone know and let the students know that we have received special commendations for each of you from Council Member Dan Drum of the New York City Council, Council Member Barry Grudenchik, and from New York State Assemblyman Ed Bronstein. So those will also be in your packets in addition to the certificates that we've created to acknowledge your accomplishment. <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer Hickey, please come help me hand out these certificates. And after, when you get your certificate, please stay up and we'll take a group shot with each class before you uh, go back to your seats. Great, and just uh, one quick note before I give them out. I also, I meant to extend my thanks earlier to both the NYPD and Queens District Attorney's Office, who every semester for my class so graciously sent speakers who the students tend to really enjoy and they really change the dynamic of our classroom discussion. So thank you to them. Now, without further ado, Melissa Baptiste. <laughs> Sadie Ann Basaraj. Janella Cintron. <laughs> Nicole Cintron. Mark Rodriguez. Daria Vereshchaka.
and Roberto Zamora. Also for the students who could not be here today, thank you to Jacqueline Adeo, Daniel Gamara Munoz, Midge Malaver, Melissa Reinhardt, and also our Dr. F Arthur Flug hate crime intern of this semester is Melissa Reinhardt, who unfortunately cannot be here today. So thank you again. Jungmin, please come up. And I'd like to ask for the photo, Jimin, if you will join us at the end. You can come up now if you feel comfortable. And I also wanted to um, mention the t-shirt design was done by Jihu Wang, uh, one of the great intern students here. But he had to leave early. So I also wanted to uh, man uh, the, yeah, mention his name here. And then also there's one. Uh, intern student who has been really active in class and also for group activity, Michael Shokto, who has, uh, couldn't make it today. So I just wanted to yeah, uh, address two intern's name here. And um, for those who are here, Memona Ali. <laughs> Umer Ali. Tameka Edward Nancy's <laughs> Maya Farouk <laughs> Malik Jackson <laughs> Adila Kosar. Alejandro Lear Plido. <laughs> Khadija Jahid. CJ and Jamin, if you join us, please. We have a uh, Just everyone squeeze in. Prom style, this side turns one way, this side turns the other way. Make them on this side. Oh. <laughs> as close as we can. Sis, are you okay? Yeah. Thank you, and now Marissa Hollywood, please join us. And when we do the group photo, Dr. Blumen, we would love to have you join us, and Dr. Call, if you would come up as well. So first, I'd like to call up Maria Abreu, the Dr. Blumen Award winner. I'm sorry, the Joanne Blumen Award recipient. Claudia Duran Garcia, the Cheryl and Stephen Levine Holocaust intern. Thank you. Okay, scrap. Ashley Gill. Kate Hong. <laughs> and Edwin Harris as well. <laughs> Edwin. Dominic Joachim. Joachim. If I say it a few more times, I'm sure I'll get it right. <laughs> Joe P. Thank you. Join. Ricky <laughs> Penayoti, who is also the student body president here at this campus. Thank you. And then the two students that were unable to be here today, Rafael Perez and Kiera Estevez. Thank you. 
<laughs> Thank you. Shuffle step. Thank you. So, in a moment, I'll invite you to join us for a reception we have down the hall, but please join me in one last rousing applause for this amazing group of students. Thank you all for coming.